Hi, this is Tony Broom. Perhaps you're unable to attend church. For this reason, we present a teaching session from God's Holy Word. It's a joy to be able to teach God's Word, and one of my favorite prophets is Ezekiel. Our scripture today comes from Ezekiel chapters 8, 9, and 10. The subject is Temple Sins and Departing Glory. We're in Ezekiel, and the scriptures are chapters 8, 9, and 10. And the title is Temple Sins and Departing Glory. God's glory will not reside amid persistent rebellion. The glory of God is such a wonderful thing. We should never take it for granted. It's a blessing to have the glory of God. The glory of God was seen in the Old Testament. Cloud by day, and pillar of fire by night. Sometimes the glory would come down in the temple in different situations. We may not see it like that now. and Sometimes, of course, it has been seen. But we have the glory of God with us all the time. The glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. And there are times when the Spirit manifests Himself. We need the glory of God today. We don't have to wait for a certain time or a certain season. We can have the glory of God any time. All we have to do is open up our heart and acknowledge the presence of God. Say, Lord, I just acknowledge your presence. You can do it right now in this place. Lord, I acknowledge your presence in this place. I acknowledge your presence in my life. I am aware of your presence. And his presence comes. It's, he's there all the time, but he manifests himself. And we acknowledge his presence in that way. Our golden text is Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 18. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. That is a disturbing verse because it tells us something's happened. Something's happened where it's disturbing. I will deal in fury. I will pour out my wrath. I will not spare. My eye will not spare. I will not pity. And even though they cry out, they will cry out to me, I will not hear them. Now, he didn't say he could not hear them. He said, I will not hear them. He decided not to hear them because of their sins, because of the abominations. People might say when you think about some of these things, you have the visions and you have the similitudes and things in the prophets and here in Ezekiel. One of the most favorite of mine would be, of course, Ezekiel. And they might say, well, oh, it's deep. You like that deep stuff, don't you? No, well, no, not really. I'm a Mill Hill boy who loves Jesus. Nothing too deep about me. I hope I'm not just superficial, though, but it's not how deep you are. Jesus never got deep. I mean, he was deep in a way, but he was simple. Jesus was simple. He came to take all the complication out of it. It's not how deep you are. These people always talk about and I've heard them say, I'm a theologian, I'm a scholar. Well, I'm not a theologian and I'm not a scholar. I thank God for what I know and I thank God for who I know. I thank the Lord I know Jesus. Amen. And the scripture says you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Doesn't mean you know everything, but you know what you need to know. I know I was lost, now I'm found. I was lost, now I'm saved. I know what I need to know to get me from here to glory. And that's all I need to know. Of course, I want to know more about Jesus. Would I know more of His grace to others show? I want to know more about Him. And that's what we need to know. And these scriptures that were written in the Old Testament were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. They were written so that we might know more about Jesus, more about His love. The first part is about wickedness in the temple. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. And so Ezekiel's sitting in his house, and I'll paraphrase a little bit, minding his own business, and here the hand of the Lord falls upon him. When it says the hand of the Lord, you can look it up in Hebrew and it's uh, actual words, the hand of the Lord. But it's a description. They were like us. The prophets were like us. 
Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. They described the best they could what they were going through. And when it says the hand of the Lord, that's his way of saying the presence of the Lord. It's not necessarily the hand came out of the sky. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the hand of the Lord. We felt that hand upon us. It may not have been a physical hand, something you could see, but you felt the hand of the Lord on your life many times. And if it's been a long time since you felt the hand of the Lord on your life, you need to get in tune. Turn your radio on. Tune into the right channel. His hand is there upon you. His hand comes upon us to bless us. And sometimes His hand comes upon people to judge. And He sees the vision because He knows the hand of God is on Him. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of His loins, even downward, fire, and from the, his loins even upward as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And so he sees this man, the same man that he has seen before in the vision, and I feel it to be, again, the incarnate Christ. He sees the man of glory, the God of glory, and he sees him there, the same one that he has seen before. This vision that he had, again to remind him, again to strengthen him, again to speak to him. And he put forth the form of an hand and took me by a lock of mine head. Now I know God can do anything, but you know what? I don't have to worry about him doing that to me. Not unless something really significant happens, right? And it took him by a lock of his head. Well, I don't have that to worry about. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven. And brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. So he begins to see now, as he is brought in the spirit to Jerusalem. They're in exile, they're in captivity, but he is brought to Jerusalem in the spirit, and he sees there the gate, the inner court, the gate, and he sees there this seat of the image of jealousy it compares to what God told Daniel the prophet there will come a time when they will set up the abomination that makes desolate Jesus referred to it in the New Testament Matthew chapter 24 this abomination that makes desolate they will set it up in the temple desecrate the temple Paul refers to it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 he talks about this man that will set himself up as God in the temple. And they will think he's God. He'll be worshipped like God. And of course, we know he's not God. There's not but one God. But this is that Antichrist, Satan Superman, who will be let loose during the tribulation period. And this same image of jealousy, this desolation that makes desolate, will be set up there. And it's all about idol worship. Some people interpret this as not idol worship and I've read a little bit on the internet but I didn't stay there too long because there's no doubt you just use your spiritual house sense common sense noodle a little bit and there's no doubt the seed of the image of jealousy it provokes to jealousy and so behold the glory of the God of Israel was there the God of Israel his glory was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain and so, again, he compares this. It's the same vision that I saw. And when I get confused and when I get down and when I get oppressed and things don't work out, people not listening to me, and the message seems like it's falling on deaf ears, I know I've got that same vision that God gave me in the beginning. i got that same experience. And you and I, we need to go back sometimes to the upper room. And they had to go back. We cannot go back to Jerusalem like the apostles. Thank God we don't have to go back there. And you may not can go back to that place. Something may have happened to it. Maybe they've torn the building down. Maybe they've done away with that place. You may not have to go back there physically, but you can go back in the Lord. And many times we have to do that. We have to get along with God. And every time you get along with the Lord, it's like you're going back to the upper room. You're going back to that place. Wherever it is, it doesn't have to be a certain place. It can be a coffee table. It can be a place by yourself at McDonald's if you can find one or Burger King or wherever it is. But you can find a place. It can be a place in the bathroom, away from the kids, away from the grandkids if you have to. You find that place. 
You know, God's a pretty good feller. He can turn off his smeller if he really needs to, right? And so you find that place where you can be with the Lord. And Ezekiel, he saw the glory of God in this image of the seed of jealousy, something that would break your heart. And we can focus on those things. We can focus on the disappointments in church. We can focus on the disappointments on the news. We can focus on all that. And it'll break your heart. It'll tear you up if you let it. But you've got to focus on the glory. You've got to focus on the glory of God. God begins to show Ezekiel their abominations. And if you read that word in Hebrew, that's, it's what it is. That's abominations. There's abominations in our land today. I'm not one that harps on political and harps on the current things. If it comes up in the Bible, of course, I'll preach on it. I'll preach against liberalism and things that are going on. But you can read scriptures I thought about this morning. You can take a software program now. You can take the commentary, whatever you have, and you can focus on love and you can just read scriptures all about love. And God is love, but that's not all that's in the Bible. There are things there that have to be addressed. And when it comes up, I address it. I don't harp on it. But there's abominations in America today. There are abominations across the nations of the world today. Abominations that are going on. People are against the flag. They're against the country. They're against the president. They're against God. They're against the Bible. They're against everything. I wonder sometimes they're even against themselves. There are abominations that are being committed. And so God begins to show him the seat of the image of jealousy. And he sees a hole in the wall. The Lord tells him to dig in the hole in the wall, in which revealed a door. Go in, said God, and see all the abominations they do here. He begins to see. He's already seen the image, the seat of jealousy. Now he sees elderly men. They are worshiping images portrayed on the walls and burning incense into idols. These are not young folks. These are older folks like you and me. They should know better. They have known the things of God. But they're worshiping idols in secret. Images portrayed on the wall. Burning incense. And next he sees women weeping for Tammuz, which is the sun god. A dead false god that doesn't mean anything. And they're sitting there, and that word is used too in the original language. They're sitting there weeping for Tammuz. This false God. And to top it all off, he sees about 25 men between the porch and the altar with their backs toward the temple and their faces eastward as they worship the sun towards the east. And they're not worshiping the S-O-N either, brothers and sisters. They're worshiping the S-U-N. And so this height of abomination is presented to us. Bring this back to our printed text, verse 17, 18. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? Is that just a little thing? You think this is a little thing that they're doing? Oh, they just have a mental problem. Okay, well, it's a bad mental problem then. Okay, they just have a little psychological problem. Oh, that's a big psychological problem. You can't blame everything. They want to blame everything and have a reason for everything. What about just sin and ugliness and meanness? When the youngest, when we were coming up, it wasn't no mental thing. You were just mean or you were not so mean. I don't know if anybody's really good or not, but you just mean or not so mean. That's what the deal is today. They take gun, they blow people up, blow places up. Oh, they just got a mental problem. What about meanness? What about demon possession? That's involved in it. These abominations. And the things that they were doing in Israel are just a foretaste, and it really goes along with what's happening now. They have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. Provoking God to anger. Yes, they do. And we still do today. Lo, they put the branch to their nose. And that's not just taking a little twig and tickling your nose with it either. He's talking about a firebrand. They put the branch to their nose. They're burning themselves up. They're destroying themselves. Therefore, will I also deal in fury? Mine eyes shall not spare. Neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. And we've talked about this a little bit already, but he decided his holiness decides him not to hear them. They'll cry out, but they're not changing their lifestyle. This is disturbing today that people, and we have presented it, 
maybe knowingly or unknowingly as a church, we presented it in such a way, come one, come all. Well, that's right, come one, come all. Come just as you are. Yes, come just as you are, but don't stay just as you are. Allow Jesus to change your heart. He loves you just like you are, but he doesn't want you to stay just like you are. For God so loved the world, we were all lost. He didn't wait till we get saved to love us. He loved us anyway. But he doesn't want us to stay lost just because he loved us when we were lost. He doesn't want us to stay that way. He loved us in sin, but he doesn't want us to stay in sin. And so his holiness decrees that he will not hear them. I will not hear them. They'll cry out to me. They'll cry loud and they'll cry hard, but they're not willing to change their lives. They're not willing to change their lifestyle. You know, we don't have to cry so loud and so hard if we're willing to change and let God change our life. If people come to the altar and they weep and they do all that, but they get up and they go out and they live the same way they did before. And the pastor says to give the invitation. You hear it every week. Those of you who see, I don't know if you're supposed to be looking or not, but you see it every week and you see that they raise their hand. They raise their hand. And they come back next week and they raise their hand. And they're raising their hand, but they're not coming forward. They're not making a change. They're not allowing God to take that thing away, whatever it is in their life. This is what happened to Israel. These sins that were there in the temple, but God was able to do away with it. He was able to change their heart and life, and they wouldn't let him. And now the second part, visions of judgment. Chapter 9 opens with Ezekiel seeing six men who were city leaders having slaughter weapons in their hands. One of them was clothed in linen with a writer's ink horn on his side. In verse 3 through 5, And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen which had the writer's ink horn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. The man here is told, the linen-clad man is told to go set a mark upon those who sigh and who cry. And those words are very similar. They're different, but they're very similar in Hebrew. They sigh and they cry because of the abominations that are going on. This is a mark that you want to have. There's a mark of the beast in, starting in Revelation chapter 13 that you don't want to have. You don't want to have it and you don't want your worst enemy to have it if you've got such a thing. You don't want anybody to have it. Because once you take that mark, you're doomed. You have to have it in the tribulation. You'll get to the point you have to have it to buy and sell and do anything. Once you take it, that's it. But you don't want to be here then. You don't have to be. And you don't want to be here then. You don't want your family to be here then. You don't want anybody to be here then and have to take that mark. That's a mark you don't want to have. This is a mark that you do want to have. Because this mark marks you for God. This is a mark that says you care about the things that are going on. You care about the holiness of God. You care about the abominations that are being committed in the country and in the capital and in the communities that you live in and even in the churches sometimes that are around. You care about the things that are going on. And you may not can change it. You may not can do anything about it. You can do the best you can. But you sigh and you cry and you pray to God and you do your best to separate yourself. Sometimes when you can't change things, you don't want to tear things up you don't want to split the church you don't want to make a mess and make a stink and so the best thing you can do is live for God yourself you can't make other people do right you can't make your wife or husband do right and the time of crowbars and belts has done gone out of style you don't do that anymore so you don't do that well what can you do well I can live for God and a brother over here, he decides, well, I can live for God. And the sister says, I can live for God. And we all live for God. And the more people that live for God, that's the less abominations that are being committed. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How does that happen? Well, the more of us that are doing God's will, that's his will being done on earth, just like it's being done in heaven. So this man was told, put a mark on him. Go out there and mark them for God. Those who are standing up for God. Those who are living for God. Those who are separated. Those who are crying and sighing because of the things that are going on. 
And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. So he tells him to go. Go kill. Go slay. Is this just a vision? Well, I hope it is. It's just a vision because it could certainly happen. And we've seen it happen. It certainly happened in their captivity to a certain extent. And they were slain. So many of them were slain in the city and they were carried into captivity. They are told to kill everyone, old and young men, virgins and little children and women. But he says, come not near to any person who has the mark and begin at the sanctuary. The time has come, the Bible says, the judgment must begin at the house of God. We're not judged like the world, but we're judged and chastened so we won't have to be judged with the world. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And if we scarcely be saved, what will be the result in the end of the sinner and the ungodly? So God is a holy God. He doesn't play. Now he's fair. He's more than fair. He's reasonable. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Your sins be bad. They be scarlet. Well, they can be like white as snow. Even though they be red like crimson, they'll be like wool. I'll reason with you. Actually, we don't have much to reason. But God is the only one who has the reason. He doesn't have to have. Thank God he chooses to love us. He tells the man clothed in linen, don't come near to any person who has the mark. They're already taken care of. And start at the sanctuary. So they started with the elders before the house and were told to kill and fill the courts with the slain. It's a gruesome thing. Awful and ugly thing. Verses 8 and 9, it came to pass while they were slaying them and I was left that I fell upon my face and cried. When it says it cried here, he's crying out in agony. He's crying out in distress. He's crying out tearfully. He's crying out. And it's, if you know anything about the Eastern wailing and lamentation, he was wailing before God. He's crying out and he said, Ah, oh, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Are you going to kill them all? Then said he unto me, a little tony words in here, uh, Boy, you don't understand. And that's the end of my words, and the Bible picks up. The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great. Great is gadol, and he uses the word gadol ma'od ma'od. In other words, great, very much great, very much, great, very much, very much, exceeding great. You don't know how great it is. It's like them giants that they people saw over there in the land of Canaan, they came back with that bad report and they said, oh, they're tall. You wouldn't believe how tall they are. They're ten times taller than Wilt Chamberlain. They're just tall up to heaven. You wouldn't believe how high they are. Exaggeration, of course, you know. And Caleb said, oh, yeah, we can whip them. We can take them. There's no problem. And you know that story. But the same thing here. Exceeding great. And the land is full of blood and the city full of perverseness. All this putrefying, is my word I say sometimes, iniquity and sin that's going on. The bad things. L.A. and Chicago warmed over. You know, it's just bad. For they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. This is what they had said, and it's recorded several times in the book of Ezekiel. Their thing was... The Lord's got tired. He's got too much to do over in Russia. And he's got too much to do in North Korea. He's just busy in China. He just doesn't shut up heaven. He's forsaken the earth. You know there are people who feel that way now. They feel, like, oh yeah, there was a God. There is a God. And Jesus even came to the world. He done got tired. Or they say where I come from, he done got tarred. And he just closed up heaven. He's forsaken the earth. And the Lord, he doesn't even see anymore. Well, he has not forsaken the earth. And he still does see. God has an all-seeing eye. He's a Jew in the sky and he's got his eye on you. He knows what's going on. Verse 11, And behold, the man clothed with linen which had the inkhorn by his side reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. He came back and he said, I've got through marking everybody. I've done 
just what you told me to do. And oh, that that would be our lot. That we would say, Lord, I've done what you told me to do. I've done the things that you've given me to do. That's what Jesus said. He got ready to suffer just before going to the cross. That great high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, he said, Lord, I've finished the work which thou hast given me to do. I've done the things you've told me to do. I say sometimes, and it's not to badger myself. Please don't badger yourself. Don't put yourself down. Don't allow the enemy to take advantage of you and put you down. Don't allow him to put you down in any way. He has nothing to say to you at all. If you're going to listen to somebody, listen to God. Don't waste your energy and time listening to him. He has nothing to say to you at all. But I do tell myself sometimes, just as a check in the Spirit, have I done anything for you today, Lord? Have I done something for Jesus today? I want to do something for the Lord every day. It may just be fixing a podcast. It may just be putting an encouraging word out to someone. It may be just something that someone would think would be mighty insignificant. But God knows all about it. And what can we do for Jesus? Well, we can pray for people. That's the greatest thing you can do. That's a wonderful thing you can do. You may not feel like getting out and going to see people, but you can pray for people. And that's something you can do for God. Well, the last part, God's glory departs. Chapter 10 opens with Ezekiel seeing again the cherubim in the throne. And he sees this vision, the throne. He sees the cherubim. The man clothed in linen is told to go in under the cherubim between the wheels and take coals of fire and scatter them over the city. And this is judgment. God is saying, I want you to scatter the fire over the city because I'm judging them. Verse 3, Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. Here is, one more time, a vision of the glory of God. It's like God is saying, do you want my glory or do you want your abominations? And the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as a voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. You can see and feel the holiness of God as you just even read this. The linen-clad man goes between the wheels. One cherub stretches forth his hand and takes fire and puts it into the hands of the man clothed with linen who takes it and goes out. When it says he puts fire into the hands. It's the hands like this, the hands that are hollow and scooped up. Not my little old teeny dishwashing hands, but the hands of a big man. Like we got some big handed men in church here, and that's what it is. He hollows his hand. He cups his hands, and this the word that's used there, the hollow of the hand, and he fills it up with these coals of fire and he takes it and he goes out because God has a lot of judgment to pour out. Ezekiel again describes the cherubim and wheels in detail saying again in verse 10 that it was like a wheel in the middle of a wheel. So we have that description again. In verse 13 is for the wheels it was cried in, to them in my hearing, O wheel. And there are two words for what it's worth in Hebrew for wheel. Ohan is one in Galgal, and here the word Galgal is used. I do not know and I have not seen why they would use different words, but that's God. God does what God wants to do. And what it says, O wheel, O, I asked my Hebrew teacher, I said, when do you use the word O? He said, well, it's really up to you translating. So that's real good to know. I'm using it whenever I want to. That's apparently when they did it. It just helps to do emphasis. It emphasizes things. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. And it's cried unto them here, O wheel. And in Hebrew it would just say, it's cried unto them, wheel. In other words, God just says it like it is. Wheel, holiness, love, fire, power. And he says, wheel. Verse 15, and the cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river of Kibar. It's the same vision. Not the same experience. It's another experience of it, but it's the same vision. Just the same, like the same one I saw back there. You know, there's no sea saw like the saw saw when you saw down like you saw in Arkansas. You know, that's what Noah saw when he came out of the ark and saw, you know. 
Okay, verse 18, Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. Now the glory of the Lord departs. This is a sad fate, a sad commentary, as I say, of the glory of the Lord departing, Ichabod. That's when the glory departs. God does not want His glory to depart. He wants His glory to rest upon us. And the New Testament describes it like the power of God resting upon you. And even if you suffer for the cause of Christ, the glory of God can still rest upon you. Even if you have a hard time, the glory of God can still be there. He helps us through our troubles. He helps us through our trials. And what God does not keep you from, He'll help you through. He'll help us. He's there to shine forth His glory. And He spoke to us in sundry times and divers manners to the fathers by the prophets. He has in these last days spoken unto us through His Son. He's the express image of His person, the glory in the face of Jesus Christ, the glory of God, embodiment of the Godhead. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we see in Him the glory of God. God said, My glory I'll not give to another. But Jesus said, The glory thou hast given me, I have given to them. And He gives us. We're partakers of His glory. The only way we can do that is through Jesus Christ. He comes to make us partakers of the glory of God. The temple sins and the departing glory. It doesn't have to be that way. We can stand for God in our generation. If our generation just quits on God, there's a broken link. We have to stand true to God. We may be living in the Laodicean church age, but we still have those, just like in Ezekiel's day, we still have those who are marked for God. We have those who are sighing, those who are crying, those who are not going along with the world's things. They may not bust stores open. We may not. We don't. We don't cause lewds and troubles and things like that. That's not our nature. That's what we used to be. That's not who we are now. When Jesus Christ, we're a new creature. We don't live that old way anymore. We do more on our knees than we do with a machete in our hand. Hallelujah. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be people of peace. That doesn't mean we go along with evil. But we're marked for God and we're standing for God. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to represent Jesus and to preach the Word of God, to teach the Word of God, and to read the Word. Even in a disturbing three chapters like 8, 9, and 10 in Ezekiel, we can still find hope and we can still be marked for God. I pray that many in our day would take their stand for Jesus and many would be saved and born again and healed. In Jesus' name, amen. You have been listening to a teaching session from God's Holy Word. The title has been Temple Sins and Departing Glory. Make sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord. You'll be ready when He comes again. This has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.